Welcome to the talk show, Life Stories with Mark Hoberman. The goal of this show is to provide a learning experience to people of all ages, with guests from various fields in academics, a wide range of industries, and insight into the many forms of art, athletics, and entertainment. We hope you enjoy the show. Actress and singer Gloria Hendry is today's guest. Gloria will talk about breaking down barriers as the first ever African-American Bond girl, as well as her many experiences in the entertainment industry. Actress, singer, author Gloria Hendry, welcome to Life Stories with Mark Hoberman. Hi, Mark. How are you? So oh, great to see you. So excited to, to interview you today, Gloria. You know, uh, you started out in show business a long time ago, but what were the hopes and dreams of a 10-year-old Gloria? Oh, my golly, a 10-year-old Gloria was right there in high school. I meant to say in grade school. Wow. Uh, and um, in grade school, and um, I was playing violin. Uh, and um, on Saturdays, I would go to play with the um, All City Orchestra or rehearse at Week Wake High School. And and we would also periodically play with the all the Essex County's um, All City Orchestra uh, and on radio sometimes. And I was doing gymnastics. I was running, bike riding, um, seeing who can hit the fence the highest, playing hide and seek, or one, two, three, O'Leary, four, five, six, O'Leary, <laughs> doing our ball, jumping uh, double dutch. Uh, playing softball, also sprinting, um, and um, academically, I was I was okay. And, wow. You know, so there I was. I lived right next door to the school, uh, my elementary school. So my mother, I was one of those latchkey kids. Wow. She would just drop us off. But when we, when we were real little, uh, the community took care of us. That's yeah. great. That's it. Hey, it takes a village. I don't know if you just told me what you did when you were 10 or from the age of 10 to 15. I'm exhausted already. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's unbelievable. And uh, so I didn't know you played. the. How long did you play the violin? Not uh, through college. Oh, do you still play? Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about not thinking, but I am going to pick my violin back up again and play a couple of tunes. Yes. That's and right now I'm working on piano. Wonderful. Yeah, but top And I'm that. also singing today. I'm also singing today in my maturity. Oh, I'm that I know. Today. I've seen videos and I heard outstanding stuff. We're definitely going to get to the singing. T tell me about a little bit about the very beginnings of your career and what led to your first big break. How do we get from violin to then school to, hey, Hollywood, here I am. Well, that's the whole point. I didn't, I didn't aspire to be an actress. I didn't look forward to anything like that. I wanted to be an attorney. So in grade school, you know, we got to like, what it was that eighth grade when I was going to school. And um, I said to my counselor, he said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, an attorney. Well, you know, doing back in those days, there were very rare female attorneys and especially women of my hue. And he patted me on my hand. And he said, let's be realistic. You could be a legal secretary. Mm. So when I graduated out of, um, uh, High school, when I went on to Robert Treat School, then I graduated out of high school, I went straight to Essie College of Business for Law, which was like an extension. In those days, you could go to a trade school and professionally, you didn't have to go to college. And I never knew I was college material. <laughs> so everybody, when I was in school, everybody had a trade. And so I was, when I was in a grade school up until high school, I typed and I did shorthand, about 125 words a minute. So I spun off writing. And I also thought about becoming a court reporter. Mm. And um, I went to Rutgers to study a little bit there, but got so boring. My mind was so busy thinking. <laughs> it was boring just to listen to other people's conversation. I was busy with my own, in my own head. Right. So I branched off into Essex College of Business for Law, and I studied to be a legal secretary. And I graduated with, a, of course, a degree. It was about a year, a year, yeah, about a year's uh, education. And I wound up working for the NAACP, working for um, Roy Wilkins before he was well-known with Browns versus Board of Education. And there was a woman of color like me. Her name was Barbara Morris, which was very rare, mm -hmm. and Robert Banks during the 60s. Wow. Well, first of all, my son went to Rutgers. Uh, so it's so interesting. Uh, it's amazing because unfortunately, the story of a uh, person of color being told 
by someone in education. Really, you can't do this. You can't do that. It's not, it's not rare. So, I know. I so, know. So, uh, but today it is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. So, in certain areas, it's probably not. Exactly. You know, I, I'm going to ask you, like, so how far, how far do you think, uh, well, let's put it this way. Sir Roger Moore said it. Uh, you were the first ever black Bond girl. As he said it years ago, there was a question about James Bond being linked with a woman of color. This is legendary. This is groundbreaking. A moment in your life, the lives of young black girls. Uh, it's a trailblazing moment, not just in your life. So walk me through your experience on the film Live and Let Die. Well, first of all, I never, I've never seen a Bond movie back in the 60s. I never saw a Bond movie ever. It wasn't something that I wanted to see. Um, but I went to the movies a lot. And I was influenced by um, Joan Crawford, Joanne Crawford, uh, Jane Powell, um, uh, Marilyn Monroe. I mean, it was like, but that was all that was on in movies. And I wanted to, I didn't think about wanting to be an actress. That's first of all. Like I said, I wanted to be an attorney. I wanted to be activist. But after Martin Luther King was killed, that just did it for me. I just, I couldn't take it anymore with the, with the snots in my stomach. Every day when we, I went to work at the NAACP and um, the bomb scares that we got, uh, people threatening our lives. Um, and when he was killed, it was like, I've had it. I walked, I think I walked around in New York City, up Fifth Avenue and Sixth Avenue crying. But I wasn't the only one. I mean, people were just crying all up in the streets. And I just jumped up and quit. I quit. I couldn't take it. This is before Browns were successful, Brown versus Board of Education, before any of that was successful. And in my mind, uh, as I look back, I want beauty in my life. I want love in my life. I want to be accepted. I need money. We were getting paid like $175 a week minus all the taxes taken out. And I, how do you live on that? But see, during that period of time, $30,000 was a lot of money. Yep. That was the top of the cream of the crop. You could buy a car for $3,000. Right. You could buy a home for $5,000. I mean, if everything was tangible, but on a certain level, I still wasn't making enough money to buy a house. And I knew I needed money. So in the process of being a legal secretary, I was always being entertained with people walking up to me in the street saying, I'm a photographer. Can I take test shots of you? You're, you're very, you know, I would like, because I they liked the way I walked and whatever. And I said, okay. And even in Newark, New Jersey, where I had lived for a period of time before I made the crossover to, to live in New York, people would ask me, um, you know, commercials were starting during that period of time. Uh, and and uh, print work was starting that period of time, and we were not allowed to have a white agent during that period of time either. So we always had to be represented by a black agent, and there was very few. Grace Del Marco agency, Black Beauty agency, uh, and um, yes, those were the agencies that I belonged to. And Helen Williams was the top model. Helen Williams out of the 50s into the 60s. Mm -hmm. Helen Williams. And then you got um, uh, with Naomi Sims, Naomi Sims, Beverly Valdez, uh, a number of other models like that during that period of time in the 60s. So I would, I signed up. But at the same time, I'm trying to figure out what to do. I wound up working for an advertising firm who wanted to turn me into, for the affirmative action situation in the 60s, was uh, ruled on, I believe, our president, was, was it Eisenhower? Uh, you know, I'm, 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 if I'm mistaken, please correct me. So, yes, and so I was the first woman of color, but during those days, we were called Negroes and colored. The word Black stayed back. And if anybody called me black, I was willing to kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a different day today. <laughs> so in the meantime, I, I joined the Grace Del Marco Agency. And um, there was only a few of us that could do commercials because it wasn't many people. My mother said, what kind of business are you trying to get into? That's not a career. And being a musician also, that's not a career. 
you need a bona fide career in those days. So, um, uh, but I was making a little decent money along with working nine to five. And um, so my income went up. And now one day I looked in the papers after working at the um, advertising firm, Murray Platt was his name. He was a vice president. He wanted to turn me into an account executive. And um, he kept promising that he was going to raise my money. And around the corner, he would go to the Playboy Club for lunches to meet his clients. Mm-hmm. And I didn't think too minutes, much of it until one day I looked in the paper and I saw Playboy bunnies making money over $1,000 a week. I said, what? $1,000 a week in cash? <laughs> I lit up. I said, I quit. And I told him, I said, I'm going to work for the Playboy. He said, he laughed. And I went over and I applied because I have photos. And they said, how soon can you start? And I, you listen, I have a, my family is very religious. I had never been in, in anything that scampy in my life. I didn't even wear mini skirts mm. back then. And uh, they hired me. And I was so scared. And as they put that costume on me, it was the most scariest thing. She said, open your legs. I said, what? Because <laughs> they had to make that 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 nice V and, yeah. you know, up and everything and your breast. Come over here, girl, and move your breasts around. I said, oh. She said, girl, I'm not going to bite you. <laughs> so it was an incredible, that was the beginning of my entertainment field. That's amazing. The fact that you didn't apply and then quit. You quit and then applied. I mean, you just, you just, you only know one speed, full speed ahead. So, uh, that's right. Really, that's yeah. yes, really incredible. You know, um, uh, on my show, we often talk about the story behind the glory. So, what obstacles did you have to overcome on your journey of success in the entertainment industry? I mean, you got into the Playboy Mansion, so that job paid a lot of money. But now you want more. You want to do more acting. So, what what obstacles were in your way? Race was extremely hard. I mean, down to the point of systematically, it was very difficult to rise above. I wouldn't care if you were a college graduate, mm-hmm. a man of color or a woman of color to be an attorney. You couldn't get a job even after you graduated. And, you know, even as a legal secretary, I could barely get a job. And it really systematically, it really, I left the law field in June of 2022. I've always had my feet in the law field all of these years. It got to a point when I couldn't even be hired as a legal secretary even right here in California. Wow. And if I was, they wouldn't really let me uh, be full out a legal secretary. They would give me menial work. So my skills would always be under. Mm -hmm. So I wound up opening my own firm called Hank's Legal Services. And I did that for around about nine years up until the earthquake happened in, uh, um, in the 90s for us out in California. But I'm simultaneously going back and forth into the law business up until 22 to make sure I had sustenance. And I've had a pretty tough time even now getting work. So I produce my own work. I, 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 put, I save my money. I put myself together and I put my own plays on. I write my own plays. Um, I, 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 I have arrangers do my own songs. Even to this day, I put my book out. I put my record out. I, and that's one thing that we have to do. But not only that, that is in the American way to say that you got to go in business. You got to be in business. If you work for somebody and you're depending on them to pay you a salary, a decent one, it's not going to really happen. But it maybe it will, but not many of us. Um, well, my experience anyway. What I'm speaking from is first person. So I'm I'm in my own business now, and um, I'm always in and out of my own business. Or if I work for somebody, I always have something else going because I can't seem to get beyond a certain level unless I do that. Well, so I think I think in all in all, life is hard, just to put it on your mirror. <laughs> <laughs> life basically is hard. And because of my my color of my skin, as well as um uh being female. Now don't forget that. Right. It's very hard for women still. Right. We're not making the same monies. 
and also given the opportunities to fulfill our careers as largely as we possibly can to be challenged. Still have that problem across the board. <laughs> well, it, it, you could be the poster child for the saying, if you want a successful future, create it. You no grass grows under your feet. You, you make no. things happen. There are people uh, who let things happen and people who make things happen. Obviously, a person who makes things happen. I want to circle back to something you mentioned. What made you decide to write your book, Gloria Hendry, 007 Bond, Bunny, Black Renaissance? What, what made you decide to uh, go from actress to author? Reason why I said, when I leave this earth, somebody's going to write about me because they're going to gather all the information from the internet and whatever and what they talk about. I said, I'm going to write my book, mm. you know, to let them know my background. It was not easy, you know, what I went through. And I tried my best to put in a, you know, what good things, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When things, it's funny, isn't it funny? That as you are moving and being successful for the moment, simultaneously, all of a sudden, the bad crap comes up right there. Yeah. And it seems invariably to happen all the time. I said, what's up with that karma? As great as you're doing what you're doing, the bad stuff just seems to come in. It's like, why is that? So you are constantly battling and, and everything looks great where you're going. But that stuff is like, what's going on here? And it doesn't stop. But I don't think it has anything to do with color. It's just the way life is. Isn't that strange? And you have to really be tough to hang in there to keep that positive thing going. Isn't that incredible? Oh, yeah. Perseverance is key. You know, a lot of people I speak to who are former actresses or actors or current actors and actresses, uh, authors that... A lot of them from the age of 10, 11, 7 wanted to do what they did. So for you to have such educational aspirations and then to be able to work with the, I'm going to name people, Roger Moore, Anthony Quinn, Yafet Koto, Sidney Poitier, so many more. How did you keep your composure while working with various legends and icons? One thing, a human being to a human being, we are all humans first. And your title is second. I mean, the human quality of, of meeting people. First, when I did meet Roger Moore, um, I said, that's the same. But I said, let's be realistic, Gloria. You don't have the role, first of all. You're here visiting. And um, and just calm down. And This is a real human being here. Okay. So I always seem to my personality goes to the core of the person. I try to speak from that point of view without trying to be... Um, that person's better than me. Excuse me. We all go to the bathroom. <laughs> we all eat. <laughs> we, we, we all have to exist and take care of ourselves. So I try my best to keep myself on a basic level and all what you acquire. And I've known people that have acquired and they are very successful. And if I speak bad about them, I would be literally killed emotionally and mentally because I might have found out some other stuff about the person. So I try my best to be kind and understand that that's a human being I'm talking to. And we are incredibly, oh, I don't underestimate or try to overestimate a human being. I try not to. Because that balance, we all have to fight that balance. All of us. Well, it's a great philosophy to have. You've been in the business so long. You've experienced so much. You've seen the, like the movie, you've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. So what advice would you give to a young person interested in a career in the entertainment industry? Besides uh, uh, sexual orientation, white, black, Hispanic, Jewish, non-Jewish, anything. A young person who wants to get into the entertainment industry. Well, um, a lot of young people, when they look at the entertainment industry, they look at it from um, having all that attention. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's incredible, the attention that you get. And when you get that kind of attention, it's scary when you really get into it. But, but at the same time, if they're looking at it from the point of view of uh, glorification, or I can make a whole lot of money um, in this industry, very few of us are making a whole lot of money. Right. Very few of us are making a whole lot of money. You've really got to really think about how you want to go about your career. And as you're going about it, you're learning. 
And but if you're looking constantly at uh, making the money, that's great. But you have to do the work. And it's a lot of work to be done. And also for yourself, keep yourself a therapist on the side, a mental therapist, because you're going to need it. And I've been in therapy in and out of it all my life. (laughs) With my background, I had a lot of stuff to get through in order to be an artist, to be free enough mentally. And I think that goes for just about anybody. Because if you, well, even if you were coming from a great family, there's always some kind of issue that bothers you, whatever that is. And you need to, I think, you know what, I think people... Everybody should have a therapist they can talk to. Mm-hmm. So therefore, their mental health, as they move along in their life, they get through the, what you call the, the negativity of knocking yourself down and hating yourself and, and glorifying others and, and find yourself um, uh, glorifying people. And all of a sudden, they do you in, and it's a mind blower mm-hmm. because you let your guard down. Human beings are human beings. We are, anything is expected, positive or negative. You know, and that's what we are. It's like a the big jungle. You pick and choose and you still stay, you know, you try to keep your level and you still and also to learn how to protect yourself physically as well, mentally as well. But um, try to stay open and love yourself and listen to that other voice inside of you and how you get into this industry. Well, everything else, anything you want to do, you start hobnobbing with people that are in the business of whatever it is that you want to do. So you'll find out what it's like. And as you move through, they these people that you are associated with, that you respect, um, they bring you in. And all of a sudden, oh, I need to take acting classes. But that's not the only thing. There's so many things involved with being an artist. And it also dis- discover the artistry in yourself. And produce your own stuff. That's imperative. Produce what you believe in. Write your own books. Do your own plays. And plays is a great way of getting in. Because it's live and you can rent a theater. You can present yourself, etc. But start with making it your business. So true because people only see the glitz and the glamour. That's why I always talk about the story be. Uh, behind the glory because it's a lot of work. But you talked about, I want to end, we have a few more minutes. You mentioned something very important to me, which is the live audience. So I know that audiences hear you sing, get great pleasure out of your shows. But what does performing in front of a live audience do for Gloria Hendry? Well, I'll say this. The first time I performed in front of a live audience, it was the scariest moment of my life. Because now you have all eyes on you Uh (laughs) or the production that you're a part of. Uh And if you're a singer, all eyes are on you and you out there individually, or you might be with a group. It is um, fascinating. Remember how when we were kids, as we crossed the street and the traffic is sitting there at the red light, We are so shy as we're walking in front of those cars. We're thinking they're looking at us and tearing us apart, right? That's the beginning of that feeling. Right. And also coming into that classroom and you're the last one in the classroom and everybody turns around and looks at you. Oh, my God. Yeah. Get used to it because people are watching you everywhere you go and judging you. You know how we judge each other as a person's walking. Oh, I know that person does such and such and such and such. You don't know doodle squat, right. <laughs> but you were already saying it. So, yes, get used to it. Phenomenal advice. So, so, so awe inspiring and so authentic. So, Gloria Hendry, thank you for joining us today and sharing so many great moments the good, the bad, and the ugly, as I said. To the viewers, don't forget to watch us on E360 TV, available on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. EST, available on Roku, Apple Fire, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire. Remember to follow us on social media. Life Stories with Mark Hoban is on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and of course, our YouTube channel. So remember to subscribe. Gloria Hendry, thank you so much for being a guest. And my book is on Amazon. Yes. My book is on Amazon, and also I'm performing on May 16th at the Catalina Bar and Grill in Los Angeles, Hollywood. Outstanding. I want to say the book again. It's Gloria Hendry 007 Bond, Bunny Black Renaissance, correct? 
Correct. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wishing you continued success and a very long, successful career. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm really it's a pleasure meeting you and looking forward to meeting you again. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Life Stories with Mark Hoberman. To contact Mark, email him at info at lifestorieswithmarkhoberman.com or visit him on social media through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn. Thank you for watching Life Stories with Mark Hoberman.